little warm this afternoon. Let's be praying that the Holy Spirit will grant us quickening mind and divine attention as we study the Word. And I encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 8 in your Bibles as we continue our study on Romans, in particular on sanctification as taught in Romans 8, titled Life in the Spirit. We continue to look at the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit found in verses 5 through 27, having just begun to grasp and wrestle with truths here a few weeks ago. We continue in part four of the person and ministry of the Holy Spirit based on verses 5c and 6. Let's go ahead then and read verses 5 and 6. Romans 8, 5 and 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. For those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. On an ocean voyage on their way home from India, a child was found playing in the cabin of the parents with what appeared to be pebbles. When asked where she got them, she replied, from father's little box. A closer look revealed that the so-called pebbles were actually uncut diamonds of great value. The point is this. Diamonds in the rough are not very attractive outwardly. They don't sparkle or shine, yet they have very great value. These uncut diamonds are, are laying all around us in the form of minds that need to be developed. Minds that are unspiritual and unenlightened, that are waiting to be taught the knowledge of Christ. As we read in 2 Corinthians 4, the work of the Holy Spirit in unveiling the Son of God to our minds. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Ultimately, God gave us our minds that we might know Him and use our minds for His glory, use our intellects and our reason and all the capacities of the mind to understand who he is and to give him glory in return and to comprehend the truths and mysteries that lead us to union with God. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. God continually seeks to shine light from his throne, from heaven as it were, into the darkness of our minds and hearts. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? So in this message today, we want to talk about spiritual mindedness. As we read in our text in verse 5c... But those who live according to the Spirit mind the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
You'll remember in our last message, the general idea of living in the Spirit and minding the things of the Spirit was the focus of our attention based on verse 5c, those who live according to the Spirit, mind the things of the Spirit. Well, as we move on to verse 6, we have developed the truth of minding the things of the Spirit further. And so, like I said, I've entitled this message, Spiritual Mindedness. Now, the Greek word for mind, phroneo, occurs three times in verses 5 and 6. And in essence, means to think. But also can mean one's outlook, one's worldview. It can also mean the spiritual disposition of a person, which can include his or her condition of heart, affections, intellect, and spirit. So the mind in the Bible, particularly as referred to in our text, the mind can refer to the thoughts in the smaller meaning or the total disposition and outlook that includes the heart, intellect, understanding, disposition, and spirit in the larger sense, which I believe is the sense in which it is used in verses 5 and 6. The idea of the mind encompasses the total being, the heart, the mind, the disposition, the spiritual demeanor, the intellect in Romans chapter 8 verses uh, 6 and 7. And so in today's message we'll talk about, at least we will begin to talk about the grace and duty of being spiritually minded. One writer describes it this way, of being spiritually minded, quote, A spiritual mind is one that views the Bible as something better than a dictionary. And the Lord's Day, with its worship services, is not experienced with drudgery. It is a mind that sees clearly and hears keenly. It is a mind of quick perceptions and prompt emotions. It is a mind that perceives the Savior as a living person and for which heaven is waiting as an expected home. It is a mind so sensitive that sin makes it writhe with agony, while it finds holiness a true delight, and finds favor with God as well as everlasting joy. In the first place then, and I trust we'll just touch on the first point and perhaps part of the second today, given our time and the heat, unless the Lord overrules, of course. Number one, initiated by the new birth. When we talk about being spiritually minded, there is a qualification first that must, we must have, and that is we must be born from above. No one can be truly spiritually minded unless they're born again. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 6, the Lord Jesus ends a long list of kingdom truths and commands with the commandment in verse 48, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, no one would argue that this is the standard that Christ gives his people to obey, which is perfection. We're all to be perfect, not just to strive to be perfect. The Lord didn't say strive to be perfect, but he said be perfect just as your heavenly Father is perfect. Though, in practical outworking of it all, we end up striving, and we indeed, none of us, are perfect. Therefore, if we would all obey the command here, then there would be no difference between one Christian and another, would there? After all, we are all the objects of God's love, are we not? We are all the subjects of His regenerating grace. We all stand on the equal ground of acceptance with Christ. And we all participate in the same protection and preserving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, it's clear that there is indeed a big difference in the godliness and moral influence that one Christian manifests compared with others. Why is there such a difference among Christians when we're all commanded to be perfect? And since we all share equally in so many wonderful heavenly blessings, 
in Christ? Well, it's due to the different levels of spiritual mindedness among believers. That's why. And this reveals the difference among believers in our convictions and our understanding of the need for holy living. In verse 6, two characters are presented. The carnal mind with its terrible consequences and the spiritual mind with its holy fruit. Verse 6 continues to enlarge upon what the apostle taught in verse 5, that those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. The two most frequently found words and used words in chapter 8 are flesh and spirit. And this contrast is perpetually made through the chapter for a reason. Whenever you have repetition in the Bible, God is emphasizing something very, very strongly that He wants us to comprehend. In this case, He wants us to understand and be convicted about the importance of being new covenant believers who are led by the Spirit and who walk in the Spirit and who gain victory over the flesh by the Spirit. And by constantly contrasting what we are to be and what we should be in the Spirit to the flesh, the Lord is showing us what we have been saved from and what we have been called out from and that we are no longer slaves of, which is the carnal mind and the flesh. If you're having trouble staying awake, and I know it's hot, please stand up in the back. Let's honor God by giving him our full attention to his word. The term carnally minded here in verse 6 is an important term, and it describes a lost person, an unsaved person, who can be found inside the church or outside the church. When we talk about a lost person, it could be a religious person or a non-religious person. These are unsaved people God is speaking of here who don't think God's thoughts after him. Their minds are always on carnal things and thoughts of this world. They were like us before our conversion. We should not look condescendingly upon them, but we should have pity upon them as we would want others to have pity upon us before our conversion. Now the phrase to be carnally minded in the Greek literally means the mind of the flesh. That's exactly the way it is said in the Greek, the mind of the flesh. Exact transliteration of carnally minded in the English. So we may use the term the mind of the flesh synonymously or interchangeably with the term carnally minded because that's the, the literal translation. And it's, it is to be interpreted to encompass, as I suggested earlier, all of man's sinful nature. Just, uh, not just an occasional sinful act or thought, but the idea of the mind of the flesh includes the totality of man's being that is under the dominion of sin. You follow me on that? We're talking about this encompassing his thoughts, his intellect, his imagination, his heart, his outlook or his worldview, his affections or his, what he loves, his disposition, and his ability to perceive. These are all his mental, emotional, and spiritual or non-spiritual faculties, natural faculties included, that are completely under the bondage and dominion and powerful influence of, of sin, of original sin. So an unspiritual person, an unsaved person, cannot be spiritually minded in the way that God teaches here in verse 6, that we are, as believers, commanded to be spiritually minded. So the mind of the flesh, or the natural man, just to explain a little further, is under the control of his sinful nature. He is ruled by sin rather than by God. Thus the term carnally minded depicts the entire course of his or her life. Either the direction of your life, life is earthly in contrast to heavenly concerning the way you think and perceive or sinful in contrast to living for Christ. 
in terms of your actions. For our actions are only a response and reflection of the way we think. The mind of the flesh signifies the seat of sinful desires and passions. It is the core egocentric person from which our thoughts and actions flow. And the mind of the flesh is manifested in a fleshly person's behavior and words and attitudes, tone of voice, disposition, demeanor, and gestures. All of these things I just described and the character of them don't occur by accident. They are dictated as far as the nature and tone, the decibels of them, the nuances of them concerning the voice, disposition, demeanor, and gestures. They, they are determined by whether you, are, you have the mind of the flesh or the mind of the spirit. So in essence, the carnally minded person is at enmity with God. And the direction of this person's life leads to death. Those who live according to the dictates of their sinful nature and in a carnal state of mind will find it extremely difficult, even impossible, to please God. They who are in the flesh cannot please God. It is a condition in which the whole soul is entirely engrossed with things related to its fallen nature. And it's sad. Even some in this room. This describes your whole life. And to come to church and to sing hymns or dwell upon the scriptures for a few minutes is the rare exception in contrast to the description of your daily life throughout the week and how you think on a normal, regular basis. It's, it's sad. To be carnally minded, then, is a law that governs the whole person, his thoughts and feelings, pursuits and pleasures. As we read of these in Philippians 3, 18 and 19, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is in their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. That last phrase describes it perfectly. They set their mind on earthly things. And the thought of that in the mind of the Apostle Paul caused him to weep, caused his heart to go out to lost, needy sinners whose minds are dictated and governed by their sinful nature, who are driven in their thoughts by lust and by a hunger and craving for earthly things, desiring insatiably to be satisfied. Oh, may we as a church, may we as pastors, may we, may we as deacons, when thinking upon the lost, which may include family members and co-workers, at, like the Apostle Paul, react in weeping and intercession before the throne of God, for God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to save their never dying souls. This is a, a terrible state. To be in such blindness, to be driven in thought, in heart, in affections, in emotion, in intellect, by, by a craving for sin rather than for the thoughts of God, should cause us to mourn and be in a state of lamentation in the house of prayer. Unless one's carnal mind and disposition and thoughts are radically changed, by the new birth, the final outcome is condemnation and death. As we read in Romans 8 and in verse 13, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And again in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verses 19 and 20, while they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. 
For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. Oh, my friend, don't be content with mere head knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet throughout the week, your thoughts are consumed with carnality and fleshly mindedness. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. He can break the power of sin that causes your mind to be held captive to thoughts and to musings and to imaginations insinuated by the devil in your mind that you take hold of in your carnality and run with until those thoughts are fully exhausted by exploring and probing the depths of sin and as servants towards that end your imagination is employed your your intellect is employed your creative thinking is employed to run the full gamut of that wicked thinking Oh, how the Lord Jesus Christ is willing and ready and enthusiastic in saving you. If you would but come to him and say, Lord, I want to use this delicate intellect you have given to me that can be so tarred and ruined by sin to be employed in your service, to speak and to think and to write coherently and accurately and eloquently about my Lord Jesus Christ and His saving death and love on the cross. Come and He will wash away all the pollutions of thought and mind and intellect and imagination that control and fill the minds of the lost. When a person trusts Christ as Lord and Savior and is born from above, God puts his spirit in him and gives the repentant sinner a new heart and a new mind, which in many passages are one and the same. This process is called conversion. And conversion initiates the sinner into a new way of thinking. And the pattern of thoughts change from carnal to spiritual. Well, in the second place, and we'll have to stop here after just a little while, we'll pick up next time on this point. I want to lay down renewed by the Spirit. Spiritual mindedness is initiated by the new birth, but it is also once born from above, Renewed by the Holy Spirit. There are several aspects of renewal. We'll not get into the core of them right now, but we want to talk about what brings us to a place of renewal, what, what causes the rise of renewal, the, the uh, initiatory elements of renewal, which is related to revelation. Revelation. Once saved, the Holy Spirit, by way of renewal, that is, renewing our spiritual mind, reveals the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to His people. This is a great mystery. How God Himself brings fully into our inner man the powerful, life-changing, tangible, Elements of Christ's nature which seem just as real and powerful as if we were talking with the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. Actually, they, they are even more powerful than that because instead of talking with the Lord in a sense where he is out there, even maybe inches away, when we are renewed by the Spirit, the Holy Comforter, the Divine Paraclete, brings the presence and person of Christ into our hearts, fulfilling the promise of the new covenant, which in Jeremiah 31 says, I will dwell in them and walk with them. What a wonderful, blessed, glorious inheritance we have that God himself comes and returns to a new Garden of Eden, to a new paradise, which is freshly constructed in our hearts. And we walk with the Lord 
in our hearts. Constantly having the pleasures of Christ and the glories of Christ renewed within us by the person and work of the Holy Spirit. When a person is saved, he is introduced to a new way of thinking. He's brought into a world of new thoughts that he never knew existed. Think back before your conversion. And think about the fact that for however long you have been saved, you have been thinking thoughts on a heavenly level that you never thought before you were converted. Some of those thoughts, as an unbeliever, you had no clue even existed or were a reality. There was a reality behind those thoughts. But upon your conversion, thoughts came flooding in, accompanied by light, in such a way as you never knew the brightness of such before. And with that light brought thoughts which awaken you to a reality of a relationship with the living God himself and which describe that relationship through many glorious doctrines in the scriptures that you never knew before. And these new spiritual thoughts replace the carnal ones as the dominating thoughts of your life. As Christians, yes, unfortunately, we still struggle with fleshly thoughts. But now the spiritual mind is dominated by godly thoughts and not by carnal thoughts. If our minds are dominated by thoughts of sin in the flesh, we need to repent. We need to repent. And I encourage you to do that right now. Where you sit, if the Lord is convicting you to do so, of any kind of fleshly thoughts. And God forbid that anyone at Christ Bible Church would bring such thoughts into a worship service without those thoughts first being weaned and, and pruned and sifted of all their wickedness from us. And that's why it's critical when we offer spiritual sacrifices and our worship unto the Lord that, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our minds and our thoughts from all sin. But when we are saved, a miracle has taken place. We're now able to think as God thinks. Before conversion, we are little better than animals, except for the law condemning us and convicting us of our sins. We do not think like God thinks. We're like brute beasts going from one fleshly lust and desire to the other. But upon conversion, God does something tremendously glorious to our minds. He lifts our minds from the level of an animal and a wretched sodomite to the level of heaven and, and pours forth light and life and glorious thoughts which angels themselves are not able to dwell upon and meditate upon. What an honor and a privilege. And is it, is it, isn't it a miraculous fact that the Lord Jesus Christ himself and the person of the Holy Spirit have the two most vital parts to play in constantly manifesting the mind of God to us and the truth of Christ to us and the doctrines of the Bible to us which represent the very nature and deepest heart of God's substance itself to us. And so therefore, we ought not to have the motive of legalistically be, being driven to meditate upon the Word of God and consume the Word of God so that we can be uh, like a clone, some kind of robotic clone of a religious person called Jesus. No, as Walter suggested, our minds should be filled with the Word of God because when we do so, in faith to the Lord Jesus, crying to Him, Open thou my mind, or open thou thy word, that we might behold in our minds and hearts wondrous things from your law. The Holy Spirit would take those things, those doctrines about the person and work of Christ, and reveal them to our minds 
which since our intellect is so confined and limited to certain parameters, and our imagination is so finite, when the Holy Spirit by way of revelation renews the image of Christ in our thoughts, we can do nothing but respond with awe. We have no words. The most articulate and knowledgeable among us can cannot utter a word but put our hands over our mouths and just respond with praise and worship and adoration to the Lamb of God, the knowledge of which of Him as found in the Bible all the books in the world cannot contain. The knowledge of the Lamb, the living Word, the divine representation of the brightness of God's image, the eternal Logos Word of God, heaven itself could not contain the knowledge of our Savior and our Redeemer. Oh, what a motivation to be like a gold digger, one of those 49ers. That's an applicable, applicable illustration for California, who we went off in the hills past Sonora, and Jamestown, where Pastor Owen goes to preach, with axe in hand to dig up the gold and pan for gold. And the Lord has given us a treasure, an inexhaustible, unfathomable treasure in His Word that the Holy Spirit takes like a divine miner. And He digs that gold out for us. He digs that silver out for us. He digs the rubies and the emeralds and all the jewels of the knowledge of Christ and reveals them to us. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And how do we have the mind of Christ? The Holy Spirit, as we read and meditate upon the word and believe that word, pulls back the veil which blocks and, and hinders the knowledge of Christ by way of revelation. He peels it back and reveals all the glorious attributes of the Son of God in rich, precious detail for us to behold. Aren't you getting a little thirsty this afternoon? Oh, my brother, my sister, Christ is waiting for you and me to search for him in the pages of the word. And also the third member of the Trinity is waiting as the revealer of Christ to just jump into your thoughts and search your thoughts and minds while he reveals the precious Lord Jesus Christ. For Jesus said, for all things I heard from my father, I have made known to you. How has he made them known to us? Oh, my dear brothers and sisters. Oh, through the pages of his word. And like a miner, we need to be patient. A miner doesn't go out and in one or two hours get discouraged before he builds his tent, before he erects his little channel, wooden channel where the water flows so he can get his pans. One or two hours before he even sets up camp, he, he doesn't find any gold, so he leaves. Nonsense. A miner has to set up camp. He's got to prepare his mind that if he doesn't find that gold the first day, the first week, the first month, even fighting bitter cold, getting out there early in the morning, he's got that prize in mind. He's going to be rich. He wants that gold. But we are told that all the treasures of Jesus Christ in his wisdom and knowledge are found in the scripture of God. Oh, let's pan for that gold with the patience and perseverance of a miner, with faith in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit will make us rich people, not with silver and gold, but with that eternal riches the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let me close with one text from John 16. John chapter 16. Is anybody hungry here today for that gold? Thirsty, even though you can't eat it. The Holy Spirit enables us to digest it spiritually. John 16 and in verse 13. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come... He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it or reveal it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. 
Let's take our minds and as a sacrifice to God, lay them at his feet and say, Lord, first of all, cleanse me of the filth of the world that I have assimilated into my mind. Forgive me, Lord, of that. Cleanse me afresh by the blood of Jesus Christ who died for my sanctification. Lord, I repent. Repent. Of everything of this world that has rubbed off of me to make me after their image. For I only want the deeper image of Christ to be stamped indelibly in the deepest recesses of my soul. Come and take my mind back from the world. Can you pray that today? If anything of the world has taken hold of your minds, I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. Would you not cry to the Lord over that today? And ask the Lord Jesus Christ to fill your mind with thoughts about Him, with thoughts about the Father and the Holy Spirit, thoughts about His glory, His goodness, His love, His forgiveness. Would you not ask Him? To fill your mind with coherent thoughts about truth and about His righteousness. And if you're not saved today, He offers you once again His righteousness. And His righteousness will weigh so heavily once you're converted by faith in Him upon your minds. You will never ever your whole life forget in your memory, which is part of your mind and your heart, the righteousness which He has imputed to you. And thereby declared you righteous and you'll never forget him and you'll never stop praising him for that let's pray thank you Lord Jesus oh thank you for giving us a new heart and a new mind and we pray first for those who have not yet been initiated by your spirit have not been converted and born from above into being a new man in Christ. Oh, we pray that you would give them a new spirit and take out the heart of flesh, the heart of wickedness, and give them, or the heart of stone, and give them a heart of flesh that is a spiritual man, a new heart. Would you not do that, Lord Jesus? They need you. Do you not see how their mental fancies are constantly distracted and that their appetite is constantly going out after the things of this world? They've memorized baseball scores or they've memorized data that tends to idolatry, whatever it would be, instead of memorizing and remembering the glorious things of Christ. Not that we are not supposed to memorize certain things of this world. We must at school and at work and in other situations. But always, if we have to do that, help us to use our memories for godly things as well as for necessary things. If so be, they are of this world. And we pray also as believers that indeed our minds would constantly be occupied with our bridegroom, the Lord Jesus, and that the Holy Spirit would sharpen our intellects, our, our reason, our, our logical abilities, our creative and, and imaginary gifts to be used for the glory of Christ in whatever biblical way you see fit to use. Hear our prayer. Help us to be a heavenly-minded church, Lord. Let us be a spiritual-minded church in this last day where men's minds and women and children are polluted like Sodom and Gomorrah by the things of the world. Hear us, Lord. Preserve our pure minds. Help us to stir up our pure minds and use them and preserve them as chaste and holy and sacred and godly in our worship of you and our service to you. For this is our prayer. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.